Okay. So first off, I was very involved in the DevOps transformation at Target. Uh, I'm actually not there anymore, though. I went to Verizon about uh, almost a year ago now, and I've been focused on DevOps transformation there. Uh, with the theme being trust, I thought, well, this will be cool. Why don't I riff on trust a little bit and think about and talk about how that plays in to DevOps transformations and look at it from some different angles. So um, first, a little bit about me. I'm a director of engineering practices and platforms at Verizon. What that really means is I have a very active role in our transformation strategy. Um, I've got uh, a lot of experience in leading large-scale DevOps transformations. Um, across the two companies I've been doing this at, it's, they've totaled over 500,000 people and over 30,000 people in IT. And so I've got some different tips and tricks I'll share today on how to drive transformations in those kind of environments. And I've also been pretty active in the DevOps community, uh, especially with um, like the, the community of management and leaders trying to drive change in, the organ in their organizations. Gene Kim actually is kind of a ringleader, I would say, for pulling a lot of these folks together. And we share a lot of practices and approaches so that we can all kind of improve transformation inside of our own companies. If you want to connect with me, uh, there's my Twitter and my LinkedIn information. And I'll explain a little bit about what DevOps VZ is a little bit later, that Twitter hashtag that you see there. Okay, so trust. Why is trust a problem today? And, and this was an interesting thing to think about because I think it's a very multi-layered problem when you start looking at DevOps transformation inside companies. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna hit it from a few different angles. I'm gonna start by really focusing on the relationship between business and IT. Uh, and then from there, we'll, we'll kind of dig deeper into where there's other, I think, trust issues inside companies. And then, then I'll talk about some approaches on, I think, how to solve those problems. All right, so let's talk about the traditional relationship between business and IT. Um, historically, IT has largely been thought of as a supplier. Uh, the way that business interacts with the IT organization is essentially through a contract. Uh, and we've spent 20, 30 years training business partners inside of, of enterprises how to operate that way. This is what the waterfall model was largely built on. You establish the requirements, you figure out what you need, and you go through a lengthy process of negotiating what those requirements are. Everyone signs off on that contract, and once it's signed off on, then the work can start. There's some challenges in this. If things need to change, it's not a very flexible model for that. If requirements were missed and they weren't understood well in the front end, it's not a very flexible model for that. And so as you get deeper into these implementations, problems emerge and frustration actually starts to emerge between business and IT. And I've actually even seen many examples of this driving um, shadow IT inside businesses where they essentially you know, work to um, work around IT because of this situation. So how did IT respond to this? Um, they introduced front door processes, right? So how do you scale, how do you do waterfall in a large traditional enterprise? Over time, you can't take on all these contracts all at the same time. So you start putting in layers to interface with the business. And those layers result in these front door processes. And that's just a way to essentially aggregate that demand, prioritize across you know, what the business needs are, and then make sure everything's lined up from an execution perspective before anyone makes those commitments and finally signs off on that contract. The problem with that is when you start thinking about DevOps, which is really focused on time to value, getting from an idea to something that's providing value to a customer or to your business out in the marketplace, this now adds a lot of time on the front end of that process. These front door processes can take six or more months sometimes before something is finally being coded in the organization. So before digital transformation, that's cool. It wasn't actually that big of a deal um, because most projects were large monolithic programs. It was pretty common for a program to take three, five years, spend tens of millions of dollars. The end result, most of the work was done manually. And the end result was you know, you'd build these large applications, these large systems that were tightly coupled throughout your enterprise. And you would actually have, um, you know, business process changes you put in place, and it would take a while to actually drive change into an organization. Um, that was great, that was fine, it worked at that time because technology wasn't really viewed as a, as a competitive advantage then. We lived in a physical world, 
and winning in that physical world was about efficiency. And efficiency, I would say, at an executive level, if you talk to an IT executive in the 90s and in the early 2000s, and even in some cases now, it's probably the word used most common to describe technology strategy. How do you drive efficiency? How do you drive cost optimization? If business determines strategy, and IT lines up to sign the contracts and deliver against that strategy, the way IT won in that world was through driving efficiency. And the way those things happen is you started to segment the, the organization, you started to build these functional silos, and you started to locally optimize each silo so that you could drive the most efficient process possible. And I'm gonna go back to that. Um, you did labor arbitrage, you started moving work to lower cost providers, and that was the way that IT drove value. Okay, it still wasn't too big of a deal then because that was the world we lived in. Then the world started to change. And we've started to move into this digital economy and the industries are being disrupted and it's happening all over the place. And new entrants, new people coming in and competing had lightweight business models, they were built on the internet, agile and DevOps, some of these things were core to just how they operated from the beginning and suddenly they're putting pressure on these traditional enterprises and these traditional segments in the market and that now created a problem because the traditional model on how enterprise IT was built cannot adapt to, to compete in this world. So, you know, in many cases, this is kind of that adapt or die moment for a lot of uh, traditional enterprises. And the game changed, right? Um, Silicon Valley, uh, obviously, and the Silicon uh, Slopes is a good example of this. Uh, digital first companies could optimize for speed and and technology was viewed as a competitive advantage and it was core to how they were driving business strategy and it is how they're driving business strategy. And I think what's interesting is technology now does drive business strategy. That's a big switch, that's a flip, right? It's not, there's a business strategy and I line up on how to execute and deliver technology to support that business process. Winning is around having a technology driven business strategy and you see it all across the industry uh, Jeff Imelt from GE went public that GE is a software company a few years ago, and they have been going after that like crazy, like their marketing, their you know, digital industrial, I think is their, what you see in a lot of their commercials. They've built a, a platform called Predix, which is an IoT platform that they're using to drive essentially technology-driven strategy to drive value for all their customers. Capital One CIO uh, went to, uh, AWS reInvent two years ago and publicly said that Capital One's going to be the Netflix of financial services. That's a pretty bold statement to go and make publicly when you're a traditional company. And they've been trying to live up to that and they've been really going after all these things aggressively and they are leading it. And when you look at financial services, Capital One is held up as a company that's going aggressive on DevOps or going aggressive on cloud. They're out speaking publicly about this stuff and this is happening all across the board. So the challenge now is traditional IT is kind of on the hot seat. They're expected to do more with less and they have to prove to the business. One, in many cases, they have to convince the business counterparts that technology should drive business strategy and many people don't buy into that yet. Um, they have to prove that they're capable of doing that, that they deserve a seat at the table, which can be different than what the, the traditional IT roles were all about and they have to deal with this pressure of having to deliver more with less because now the business is responding to these competitive threats and they are expecting to be able to move more quickly. They are expecting IT to be more agile and the challenge now is it really puts IT on the hot seat. The problem is the system didn't change. Everything was still based on that kind of traditional enterprise model, largely waterfall based. Um, it wasn't optimized for agility. The way IT tr started to sol try to solve these problems was to throw more people at it. The problem is when you start doing that at scale, the system actually breaks down further. And so what happens is you start to get some distrust growing between business and IT. Because I business isn't trusting that IT can deliver, and IT is frustrated because the business is continually pushing for change and they want things to be more responsive. So that's a big problem, that's, that's a trust problem. So that's one level that there's a trust problem in organizations. Um, so how do we solve for this? 
along came Agile, and Agile was amazing. It was awesome. It promised to solve all the world's problems. You could continuously deliver value to your customers. You could respond to the market. You could respond to needs, and everyone was excited. Companies started going out and hiring Scrum Masters and running their projects as Scrum teams and started doing scaling frameworks to figure out how to apply it into their program management methodology. And that was all well and good. But the problem was that gains were limited. A lot of agile transformations fail. And when I've looked at some of the research on it, it's somewhere around 70% of initial agile transformations in companies fail. And one of the main reasons they fail is they're almost always started off as a technology-driven program. It's inside the technology organization. It's about transforming how we write software. And that's not what Agile is all about. It's really about a business transformation. And it needs to transform how business and IT interact, how you develop software, and ultimately how you deliver that software to your customers. One of the principles in the Agile Manifesto is continuously delivering value to your customers. You can't do that when you're only focused on it as a software development methodology. And so people got frustrated, right? It wasn't working. Let's look back at why it wasn't. First, let's go back to the contract. Remember the contract? That didn't change in a lot of these companies. You still had the big front door process. You still had business queuing up the work that they needed to get done in a long, long wait time before a team finally starts coding against it. That's not agile. When you think about time to value, that's six months plus of wasted time. So development started sprinting, and that's great. Development started churning out code really fast. But then the problem is the downstream delivery. How do you queue things up for QA? How do you think about deployment and operations? A lot of those processes didn't change initially. And so you had these rapid sprints, and everything was bottlenecking now at centralized QA processes that still weren't largely automated and hadn't adapted to this kind of a model. And then now you've got all this pressure on the business to still push code to production. A lot of these teams you know, have to give a bit on quality. And now you're, you've got the classic DevOps problem where dev, ops is concerned about dev pushing, you know, being cowboys and pushing code into production. And so now think about the misaligned incentives that are happening across your IT organization. And there now is some trust issues across the different functions in IT. So there's a term for this. I didn't recreate slides because a lot of people have, so I stole one of Jez Humble's slides. Um, Jez does an amazing talk on this, but water scrum fall is actually the way that Agile has largely been implemented in organizations. And it's exactly what I was just talking about. You still have long planning cycles, um, long times up front to come up with ideas, align on those ideas, get it through an IT front door. Then you get Scrum in the middle where people are moving really rapidly and then everything's queuing up for the, the last mile, essentially. And um, that's a challenge. It, it doesn't work well. It can be a good step towards an agile transformation, but it can't be the end goal. And I think if, as long as companies recognize that when they go in, they can still be successful in their transformation. But um, all too often, I see it in almost every company I've ever interacted with, this is the model they're either in now or it was the model they were stuck in for quite some time. And trust is a real issue in that model. So trust in IT, I, I started to allude to this earlier. We've got these misaligned incentives now. Um, and you know, I actually have, and, and, these, and this is because work is still queuing across these functions to be delivered. And I have a little bit of a personal story here. This was before I personally kind of got into DevOps and got really passionate about it. I was. I was running a, an analysis on why did it take so long to have um, large like BI reporting projects delivered to the business and the situation I was in. And most of those projects were taking more than a year. I'm like, why is that? It, 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 I don't understand why it takes so long. And when we did this analysis, there was 15 centers of excellence that you had to work sequentially across to deliver these projects. And what happened is because what you saw is the ones downstream, like the testing teams and the ops teams, sandbagged their estimates significantly. And the reason they sandbagged their estimates were because they kept getting screwed. Every time a project would come in, everything would be delayed. And by the time it got downstream, now it's hitting them and they have no time to respond. So they're, they're optimizing locally to account for that. And then when you start to look at it end to end, a simple reporting project can take 18 months. That's a really, really big 
problem. That's a, a systemic problem inside of an organization. And that's largely what started to kind of the prelude to, to driving DevOps transformation inside some of these traditional companies. So along came DevOps. And DevOps was awesome. Finally, now we're talking about transforming the entire IT value stream. It was the, the first time that I feel like there was a really a lot of focus on how do you transform from business to IT interaction to Dev and Ops interaction to QA, security, the whole thing. How, does it, how do you optimize end to end? How do you work together? How do you automate end to end? And that was exciting. And I, that's where I really got into this. Four or five years ago, I, was, um, I read The Phoenix Project which was a very eye-opening book for me. I would recommend anyone read it who hasn't. And you know, for me personally, I, I empathized with all of the main characters in the book because I'd played all of their roles. And ever since then, it really opened my eyes to DevOps. And, and I've been kind of an evangelist of it and, and have pursued transformation roles to drive those change inside companies ever since. So what is DevOps all about? In one sense, it's largely around optimizing for speed. And that traditional model that enterprise IT has been in, it's about optimizing for cost. It's a fundamentally different model, approach, culture, mindset to start optimizing for speed. When you optimize for speed, a couple key things are happening. One, you're starting to automate end to end. You're not automating each function. To, again, that's local optimization. You don't actually solve the value stream often when you do that. You automate end to end. You instrument and measure end to end. And um, you start focusing on what's the time to value. How long does it take you to actually deliver value to your customers? People started moving towards full stack teams. And Amazon coined the term two pizza teams, which I love, um, which essentially means you have a dedicated team that's fully owns and accountable to something in Amazon's world. It's services inside, the AW, inside of Amazon. And you don't want the team to be any larger than what it takes to eat two pizzas. And, but a big shift. These are cross-functional teams. They have all the skills they need on the team. They're very DevOps-oriented. They have the same incentives. And it's absolutely breaking down silos inside organizations. Now you're not working across all these functions. You're, you own and you're accountable for delivering the thing, whatever that outcome is that you own, whether it's a product, a service, a customer experience. But most enterprises didn't grow up that way. And uh, this is a big shift if you've built your whole career in that previous model where it was about efficiency and it was about locally op local optimization. How do you drive better process and better cost efficiency? And not everyone's super open to change. And this is a pretty drastic change inside organizations. I'm going to dive in a little bit into how big of a change this is. So this presents a bit of a problem. And this, this is a big trust issue now in DevOps as well. Because a lot of those people are, a lot of the people that are struggling with change tend to be in middle management. The senior executives, they read CIO magazine, they read Forbes, they read everything that says like DevOps is nirvana and digital transformation and everything's wonderful and we gotta do this. So that's great, they're all on board. As you expose people on the ground, they see it, they feel it, they enter, like it's a different vibe when you're working in this way. But it's really hard to pivot the middle. And I see it in every company I interact with uh, in the community as well as companies I've worked at. And a lot of work has to go there to help people understand how they add value in this new model and how their roles change and how, do they, how to get people comfortable with getting behind this when it's so different than how they've led teams in the past. Um, and then what about the people on the ground? At first, when you're introducing a change like this, this is a, a change in expectations for individual contributors, too. What's it mean for their roles when you have these full stack teams? What's it mean for career progression? Um, what's the new performance expectations? Like, how are they going to be successful? Where can they go with their careers? Can they do the things they were doing before, technically, or, is, or do they need to change how they're operating? And what about this whole, um, you build it, you run it? A lot of people didn't sign up for that, and that's actually a core aspect of these full-stack teams. You own the things that you build. You, you run them in production as well. A lot of people didn't sign up for that. Um, a lot of developers aren't super excited about that. So how do you actually help people through some of these changes? And now we're talking about T-shaped people. This is a term often used in the DevOps community. Uh, and essentially what it means is in the old model, people built deep, functional expertise. They were really, really deep on one thing, and in many cases, they spent their whole career doing that. 
Uh, and now we want to have more people that can branch out more broad. They can do more things from a technology perspective. They may still have that deep area of expertise, but they, you want them to go broader and cover more aspects of the technology stack. And not everyone needs to be T-shaped, but you need some of those in those teams to really drive success. And again, people want to know what's that mean for, for their career. Imagine someone that was doing server administration or um, Java development or you know, QA or testing for 20, 30 years and they'd been growing in that role and now we're saying you should, you should start to branch out and do other things. That can result in change resistance. That can result in some trust issues between the people driving the transformation like, and the people that and the organization that's going through transformation. And I already talked about management a little bit, but uh, you know, the old model of management was you, you, know, you build these large organizations around these functional areas, and um, you were rewarded for that. And a lot of, a lot of management, uh, you know, people in middle management today, and I, I, I'm in this boat as well, we were rewarded because we could drive those large application programs that took two or three years. And, the people that had the bigger programs with the bigger investments, they tended to move up and take on more responsibility aligned with those types of incentives. And now we're talking about smaller changes and more rapid change and responding to customer needs. It's a very, very different model. And how are those, peop how are those people in those roles going to perceive this type of a change? It's going to be a trust issue between the folks driving the transformation and the organization that's going through the transformation. So the reality is um, roles are changing, and they're changing pretty significantly. And I think this is why DevOps transformation is so hard, is all the roles are changing. And I'll, and I'll get into it here in a minute. But how do you help people get through that change from a mindset perspective, from a skills acceleration perspective? To me, that's, that's what it's all about. That's what I tend to focus on with DevOps transformation is how do you help people get through this change and how do you accelerate teams going through this change? So I tend to be the culture guy. That's often what I focus on inside organizations. So the teams today, so let's break down this full stack team model a little bit more. The current state, you've got your functional teams, you know, the waterfall process where you've got your, your business executives, your product managers, you've got developers, you've got project managers and analysts and testers and implementers and operators and they may all come from different organizations. In many cases, they actually report to different managers, and, and th their whole career has been about building depth of expertise in those areas. And now, I'm oversimplifying a bit, but a lot of where teams are going is you basically have product owners, scrum masters, and engineers. And let, I wanna dive into this a little bit. Um, engineers, for instance, is a broad term. There's a lot of technical roles in the current state model that I like to talk about those transitioning to engineer roles in the new model. And what that means is, again, DevOps, optimizing for speed, it's about automation, it's about agility. The way that we achieve that from a technical perspective is everything needs to be as code. Testing needs to be as code. Infrastructure needs to be as code. And um, ops needs to be as code. And there's some core competency that your technical people need to have in software development, in automation, in source control, and all these different things that are core development practices. So while they may have different functional areas of expertise like testing and infrastructure, it is really largely about people moving more towards software engineers. And for the non-technical roles, there can be a path for change there too, right? So in the, in the new model, it, it's, you know, there's far less analysts and, and project managers in a lot of companies that are going through these changes but there's far more scrum masters and product owners. And those are roles that tend to grow them within the organization. And you can put a change program in place to help people get through that transition. There, there are skills that people can build so they can transition from those, those older roles in the old model to new roles in the new model. They have to choose to, right? It's gotta be a career decision that they own and they're ready to make. But you can help people make this transition. And from, from leaders, this is a big shift for management as well because in the old model, management largely directed work for their team. They aligned resources, they allocated them, they told them what to do, and they largely were managing projects and programs. And in this new model, it's about coaching and servant leadership and how do you enable the team and guide them on the practices and the patterns and the architecture and 
clear the roadblocks for them, but give the team autonomy to drive their own direction and make the decisions they need to make in the context of building or delivering a product or service. That's a very different skill set. There's a lot of work that you have to do with management to help them get comfortable with these types of role changes. <clears throat> and there's new operating models emerging around this. And, and, and I'm talking about in large enterprises now, not just you know, startups or tech companies, but um, enterprises actually moving from a traditional siloed or functional model and moving towards more of a product-based operating model where Again, at scale now, you're organizing these teams around outcomes, around products or services that they're going to own for the organization, whether they're external customer facing or internal business customer facing, or they're providing a platform internally that other teams are building products on top of. The model is very similar. There are these full stack teams that fully own the thing that they're delivering. And I actually was personally involved with fully transforming a very large scale enterprise to this exact model. Um, one of the groups I'm involved with in the external community, it's called the DevOps Enterprise Forum. Uh, it's something that Gene Kim kind of leads, and it's an offshoot of the DevOps Enterprise Summit Conference. So every spring, a group of 40 or 50 of us go out to Portland and spend three or four days really working on solving whatever the bigger DevOps enterprise problems are that year and trying to come up with white papers and guidance for the industry. This uh, white paper referenced on the slide uh, emerged last year, um, I wasn't involved in that subgroup, but it's a really, really, really good white paper that lays out four different operating models from traditional functional to matrix to product to even some futuristic one around more adaptive organizations. It's really, really good. I'd encourage you all to go to that link and, and uh, download it. All right, so let me shift gears a little bit. Um, in light of everything we're talking about here, how do you drive change and guide change in a very large organization? How do you help people through this transition? So I'll, I'll get into some more specifics here in this last half of the presentation. Uh, first, make the new expectations clear and communicate them continuously. Uh, you have to communicate constantly, even while you're framing the transformation. You've got to do it through all levels of the organization. One tactic I've seen really well is when the senior executives run informal town halls, no planned content, but it's literally them connecting with people on the ground and taking the live Q&A and helping guide people through um, the change as it's unfolding. And that does a really good job of flattening the organization a little bit too, because the traditional means of communication is largely a cascade model where executives say what it's going to be and they work it through six, eight layers of management. And by the time it gets down to the people on the ground, they don't even know what you're talking about anymore. All right slide is not working with me, but so how do you foster large-scale DevOps culture change? Um, there's really some, some steps here, and it's a playbook I tend to follow that I think is really important, because at the end of the day, you've got to build some groundswell and movement around this change in addition to the executives saying this is the thing we need to do. And the goal is to meet in the middle, get the tops down pressure to change, and get the bottoms up energy to change. And when those things meet, that's when the magic can happen. And so a few things I, you know, that I focus on. One, you've got to get people excited. And DevOps Days conferences are a great way to do that. I mean, they're all about community. They're about getting people together to talk about how they're driving these types of changes. Um, run them, if you've got a big enterprise, run them inside your company. I've run many of these events. I'll talk a little bit about how to do that here uh, soon. Teach people the in interesting things, the new roles and new skills that they need to learn. And I'll talk a little bit about, there's some different tactics to do that, whether it's certifications and training programs. But I'm also going to talk about dojos and, and how that model can work inside companies. Reward new behaviors. Um, do things like gamification and get people excited to practice new behaviors. And I'll, I'll talk about an, an interesting model we're doing at Verizon called the DevOps Cup that's focused on that. And then, most importantly, lead differently. And what you need is some people that are willing to, you know, let's say in the middle of the organization, willing to stand up in front of a public setting and challenge the status quo and the kind of the, the conventional norms of the enterprise. Because you're trying to change culture. And what you need to do is show people on the ground that it's safe to challenge the way that we've done things before. And when they see people starting to stand up and do that, they can actually start to open up more and they start to share how they feel about how things can change. Community starts to build, movement starts to happen. The picture there 
we actually, our first DevOps event at Verizon, I didn't tell anyone, like the TV people or the executives or anything, and we pulled up, but we decided we wanted a DevOps mascot. And uh, so we pulled up Teddy, the DevOps bulldog, up on stage when I was doing the opening MC work. And uh, it was, gr like, people responded really well to that. It was very counterculture to how we'd operated before. And it was just a simple thing, but it got people talking about this type of stuff. And we got them out of there before the policy makers got, got to us. Commit in the skill transformation. You have to invest in your people. If you want to rebuild trust, show people that you're investing in them. Fund the training programs. Fund the cloud certifications. Bring in product and scrum master training. I'm going to talk about dojos, which is my favorite way to focus on this in a minute, but you've got to invest in this model so that you can help people make this change. And you have to create a safety zone. You've got to make it okay to fail and okay to learn. And when people are under those timeline pressures, on the commitments they have to their business, and you're saying, hey, you guys need to learn all this new stuff, you have to slow down to speed up. And I often, this is an, a point I really have to emphasize with management a lot. You don't just snap your fingers and suddenly have agility. Like, you have to work at it, and you've got to give people space. They have to have time to slow down. They have to build the new skills. You get your velocity and you get your speed as an outcome of that, but it is an investment. So there's a, a framework and there's some research out on the industry, I've got the link for this particular one, that we focus on a bit lately, um, kind of retrospectively when I've looked at the dojo model that we've created, uh, called Accelerated Learning, and actually focused on accelerated learning with adult learners. And there's some characteristics that, when they're all together, creates a really, really good environment for accelerated learning. Um, one, it needs to be a positive learning environment, somewhere where people feel safe. They feel like they can experiment, and, and you know, they don't feel like they're having the pressure of their day-to-day -day impacting them. The total learner involvement, people are fully committed into the experience. It's not something they're bouncing in and out of. It's not something they're checking their cell phones on every five minutes. Um, full collaboration among learners, so it's not just teacher teaching to students. It's people collaborating together to drive that learning experience and variety that appeals to all learning styles, so mixing in different techniques to drive learning, because people learn different ways. And when you can incorporate a lot of that into a full experience, now you're really hitting everyone at the most optimal way for them to learn. And really importantly, contextual learning. And this is why I'm a little critical at times on training programs, because you'll go and get trained on something, and often you'll, you'll do it before your team's ready to actually use it. Um, or it's not contextual to your environment. You're learning something like you're learning AWS training or DevOps tooling training, and it's in the classroom where you don't have the constraints with how your security groups expect access controls and all the environmental configuration challenges that you have. And so when people bring it back into the workplace, then they start hitting all these walls and it's frustrating. Or they aren't even, their team's not even at a point where they can make use of the skills yet, so it's out of context. So one model that um, I introduced at Target and I'm also doing at Verizon is uh, creating these intentional learning environment. We call them dojos. And really what a dojo is, is uh, it's a, I call it a transformation immersion center. So you bring in these dedicated teams. They come in for extended periods of time. The model I use is typically a six-week engagement. They bring their work with them. They're not coming in to take a class. They're bringing their product backlog with them. And they're fully dedicating their time, or at least like six hours a day. So you leave, leave some boundaries for them to deal with some BAU stuff. And they're learning together while you're layering in coaches that are experts in all these different practices that you want people to learn. Um, product thinking, agile practices, DevOps practices, CICD, test automation, test-driven development, cloud, cloud-native development, depending on the app. So depending on the tech stack, you, you will actually kind of adapt this model to where the team's at. API-first design. There's a whole slew of things that they learn. And, and when you think about what companies are going through with this full kind of DevOps transformation, the, the level of tech change in the industry in the last even few years has been insane, and it just keeps increasing. And so when you start tackling these problems individually and you start having people try to learn all these different things separately, it creates a lot of burden on teams to, to handle all that learning and incorporate it into their day-to-day. -day. What we do here is we bring everyone together into a fully immersive experience and they're learning just how to work differently. At the end of the day, they're just learning how to do modern technology delivery. And in some cases, they don't even know that what the thing is they're learning that day is around product thinking and, and you know, value map or customer mapping, et cetera. 
Um, the way the model works is uh, you have the full stack teams, they come in, you do a highly iterative um, uh, sprint cycle, two and a half day sprints, because you're teaching people how to get comfortable with failure. A two day failure is a lot better than a six month failure. Uh, you're also teaching people how to break work down. They're not used to small batch. They're not used to breaking work into very small increments that they can deliver and demo every few days. And by doing that, we're also getting a lot of repetition throughout six weeks, so they're building a lot of mastery in how to practice Agile. Um, the outcome of this is teams get faster time to value. They level up their tech skills. So personally, this is helping them with that transition. And it's preparing them to actually move into these full stack teams, because in many cases, they're not in that kind of a product model when they come in. This uh, model has been starting to grow in the industry, and there's a few companies that have publicly talked about it. I know of at least as many that are doing it that aren't publicly talking about it. Um, obviously, it was a big deal at Target. It was core to our transformation there. Um, also, Compose Labs from Allstate uh, is a very similar kind of model. And Capital One has been very public about their use of dojos as part of their tech transformation. Uh, it's also a vendor, it's, it's a vendor model that's been used in the industry lately. Pivotal Labs is probably the most notable example of that, where you actually put your people, your full team, into a lab and they fully immerse full paired programming for the duration of building that product. It's all about skills transformation and accelerating the build of the product. I have till 9.30, right? Okay, all right, I think we're good. Uh, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the DevOps Cup. Uh, this is new to me, it was something Verizon was doing in one of our lines of business when I joined, and it was super fascinating to me. We pulled it central. I convinced the thought leader, Nanda Kumar, who's a great fellow, great DevOps mind at Verizon to come, come join us centrally and drive this change across the lines of business. But it's essentially gamifying teams building their capabilities and building their skills and practices. And we do that by measuring on a few things. How do they do just day-to-day -day DevOps practices on their SDLC, you know, test automation, how frequently they're, up, they're, um, they're uploading code, how frequently you know, they're doing builds, et cetera, and they can build or, or lose points throughout the course of, of time. Uh, we, we layer in different events that people focus on, so we'll have hackathons, um, we're driving crowdsourcing, encouraging people to, to do pull requests against other repos. Um, tech talk, so sharing your skills or your knowledge with others in the organization, because again, we're trying to build community and culture. Uh, all of those things can build points. And, uh, and then finally, uh, architecture patterns and practices, and really guiding people towards the types of practices and patterns that we think are gonna help them be successful in the future. And we turn it into this co annual competition. People compete all year. The top, the top teams end up getting judged at the end of the year, and we bring in external judges. Gene Kim actually helped judge, judge last year, which was really cool, and, and people get a cup. It's like the Stanley Cup. They get their, name in, their team name on there, and they get to carry it around, and we, we ship it globally throughout the year, so India gets it for a while, and the U.S. gets it for a while, um, depending on where the people are at for that team. And we're working to scale that model out right now. All right, the other thing on building trust and driving this change, Celebrate all of your successes and manage, this is really important for management to reward people that are changing. And if, if they show that they're investing the time and they care about people, even if they're really small wins, all of that stuff's super important. You've gotta celebrate that stuff. And then I've started to talk about community, but I, I wanna talk about how do you build community around DevOps transformation and what's a really, really good tactic for that. And it's, one great tactic is um, DevOps days. I mean, this is, that's what these events are globally. It's all about building community. It's about building community in Salt Lake. It's about building community in all the other cities that these events are in. Why not do that inside your company? And if you've got 20, 30,000 people in IT inside your company, this, you can get a pretty interesting ecosystem to, to drive these types of events. I've run 10 DevOps, internal DevOps conferences over the last four years and I've uh, had over 9,000 attendees across those conferences. Um, my first one at Verizon, we had 3,600 people um, because it's just such a big company. And it's exciting, you get people together, you build energy, you get excited around change, and you start to drive that community. People start to share with each other. There are some steps that I guide for people to go through this type of transformation and run these events. You wanna get an uh, awesome organizer, get the right space, find passionate volunteers, get great speakers, from your local community inside the company. 
get everyone invited, guerrilla market it, market it every way you can, and make it really fun for people. How do you deal with resistors? Um, you're still going to have resistors in this model. And uh, there's a quote I love using by Jesse Robbins. He was the master of disaster at Amazon, and then he uh, was one of the co-founders of Chef. And he uses a term, I use the context differently, but it's don't fight stupid, make more awesome. His context is if you're trying to drive change in your company and people are resisting, you go work somewhere else. I work in really big companies, so you get like sources of awesome and sources of stupid all over the place. So my context is focus on the people that want to change inside the company and build energy and momentum with them. Don't get bogged down by the resistors. Yoda is my favorite DevOps master. He's very wise. Unlearn what you've learned applies very well. At the end of the day, this is all about changing mindsets. That's what it's all about. And people have to unlearn and kind of rewire the way that they think about value and the way that they think about driving work. All right, two slides on Verizon. I figured, you know, I'm, I'm more here sharing a point of view, but I figured I'd share a little bit about what we're doing. Our transformation program has four key pillars to it. Um, it largely mirrors some of the stuff I've talked about today. So one is focused on enabling technology excellence. That's things like our public cloud strategy, our API first strategy, really getting the right platforms in place to support those efforts. My favorite one, which is tech culture, things like DevOps days and cups. And so I'm running DevOps days every two to three months, uh, twice a year in India, four times a year in the US in different locations. Scaling the practices, um, scaling our dojo model. We're actually um, implementing five dojos this year. We have two open already. Uh, two of them will be in India, three in the US. And then transforming the operating model is kind of the, the last part I want, that we'll focus on. We're starting to get into that. But that's how do we actually move to these teams at scale? And how do we optimize our model for DevOps? And um, the other thing we're doing is we're starting to talk more publicly about what we're doing. We want to open up our culture and get people sharing. And there's a lot of good tweets on here. You can see examples of some of the DevOps days we've run in India and uh, the ones in Texas there, those two pictures on the bottom. That was just two weeks ago. Um, some comments in there on dojos. What I would say is um, go to that DevOps VZ hashtag. You can see our entire transformation chronicled. You can see all kinds of input on all the things I talked about here. Uh, and finally, last thing, uh, that forum I'm part of that I showed the operating model things for, the group I was part of last year actually wrote a white paper on how do you lead change inside large organizations. I talked about some of those tactics here, but there's so many more. If you guys want to learn about it, go to that, go to that link. Uh, download the white paper, uh, and if you guys want to talk to me more later, I think we're going to have an Ask the Expert, Expert, Expert booth, so please come and talk to me there, and we can chat more on it. That's it. Thank you.